very simple recipe, so feel free to ask me about it. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here at the Sharing Summit, and uh, just so happy to uh, be sharing some of my pride and my passion in our profession and sharing with parents. Uh, just absolutely thrilled to be the first person on the agenda. Love being early in the morning because I've always had this philosophy that uh, when I chose the teaching profession, I taught for 25 years in the North Region District School Board, and I bounced out of bed to go to my classroom, to my schools, every single day. And I consistently told people, this is better than winning the lottery. I bounced out of bed to go to work every day. How lucky for me that I chose right off the bat the profession that was for me. Sometimes being first thing in the morning, however, can cause a little bit of stress. And some of you won't be able to relate to this. Uh, I'm 53, so first thing this morning I look in, and I love the beds here at this hotel and the pillows. Um, but first thing I look in the mirror in the morning, oh my gosh, pillow crease, one side of my face. I only have like an hour to get this out, right? Like I had a straight iron, did I bring my daughter straight here? Can I use that for a towel? Uh, but it's gone, we're all good. <laughs> So 25 years of teaching, 25 of years of feeling passionate about who we are in this profession. And how do we advocate for that? I'm going to start with two things um, to have you reflect on how do you advocate for this profession yourself, with parents, with students, with the community, with stakeholders. There's um, research that has been done consistently over the last 10 years from a marketing firm in Montreal. And I'm going to read it to you because I doubt that you've heard this before. Once again, teachers scored very high in public polling on the most trusted of professions. Montreal-based polling firm undertakes the Profession Barometer, an annual survey of public trust levels <coughs> in various occupations. Nationwide, teachers held the trust of 88% of the population. They have maintained that position for the last 10 years. Teachers rank just below yellow, who do you think is top at 97%? Nurses. And are you? Nurses. Nope. Nope. Anyone else? Think uniform, gray area. Firefighters. Firefighters at 97%. Uh, next place at 94%.
kindergarten and grade one teachers, could I take some of the kids out in the hall and interview them so that I could use them in this presentation? And I simply asked the kids to help me with this and told them they could be famous um, because I'd be using their quotes. But I wanted to know uh, what is your definition of a teacher? So here we are from the mouths of babies. A teacher is someone who teaches kids. It is someone who goes to meetings sometimes and really should be a nice person. <laughs> a teacher is a person who causes you to do homework and read. Uh, they take it to the library on some days and they should know how to be mean when kids be bad. <laughs> this one I love. A teacher should be smart already because they have to give away their smart to a lot of kids for years. When teachers have finished teaching at the end of the year, they have given all their smart to their kids. They need to get some smart back over the summer. <laughs>
not meant to ask me about their reading or anything else. This is just a two-minute celebration of something you should be proud of with your child. And uh, so I was in my classroom one day, and this is my story of 25 years of making sunshine balls, and it happened in my first year of teaching. Uh, and then I never stopped making them. So I was had centers going in my room. first year. It was chaos, and uh, I was working at a writing center because I graduated when it had to be hands-on learning all the time. I remember going and looking out my hall door to see if the principal or anyone was coming and closing the door, bringing the kids up onto the carpet to teach a phonics lesson, something really structured, um, like I did with my dolls at age six, um, and then get them back to the centers in case someone walked into my room because it was just the reverse in child-centered learning at the time. And it wasn't fitting with my teaching style, and it was Years after that, that I found my own balance. But this day, I was working with kids at the writing center, and my class was noisy. I had 36 grade one children, and I heard some kids over in the corner saying, uh, "You need to stop that! Don't do that!" And all of a sudden, I had little boy Sean, who knows I use his name to tell the story, and Sean came over and tapped me on the shoulder at the writing center and said, "Like this, maybe? Are you going to do something about that?" And I stood up, and I'm humiliated with because I can remember my body language, my tone of voice, and I'm like, "Yes, Sean." What would you like me to do? He said, well, do you know what they're doing over there? And I said, sort of. And, uh, and he said, well, you need to stop them. So I walked and I said, okay, come with me. We walk over. And there were three little boys in my class that I had overheard them say, well, let's pick the legs off and see if there are eight legs on a spider. And I was so caught up in everything else, and I'm embarrassed because one of the things I was teaching time in grade one was appreciation of living things. And here I have a little six-year-old boy saying, are you going to do anything? And so I said, okay, like, let's, you know, stop it, let's go. And Sean said, I said, what do, you, what do you want to do now, Sean? And he said, well, save it. And he went over to the art center and he got the biggest piece of construction paper that I had there, which as he walked back over, I was like, he doesn't even like spiders. He doesn't want to pick this spider up. He doesn't even want to put it on a little piece of paper. He got the biggest piece. And I watched that spider limp up onto this construction paper because one leg is gone, and I have felt bad for that for 25 years. Um, I said, what now? He said, we have to let it go. And I did the next horrible thing of my career, and I said, everyone sit down and be quiet, and I left my classroom and walked with Sean to the outside door, and I watched him put the paper down and just quietly whisper, be free. And I went home that night, and I was just beyond upset with myself. And it was one of those reflective moments of holy smokes, you were done doing something terribly wrong. However, um, I was waiting to watch, this is going to date me, I was waiting to watch Dynasty. <laughs> um, it was coming on at 10 o'clock, and it was also the night that Michael Jackson was going to air the Pepsi commercial, that first big Pepsi commercial they had done where he was actually burned with the making of the commercial. I was like, oh, do I call Sean's parents right now and let them know about this today, or do I watch it? Thank you, I, may I thank goodness I made the decision to pick up the phone and call, and it was his dad. The mom was doing a night shift at the hospital, and I said, we haven't met yet, but my name's Joanne McGee, and I just have to, I know Sean's sleeping, but I have to tell you something incredible. And I told him the story. I said, so whatever you're doing, raising your child, keep it up. And thank you to him. My teaching will never be the same. It will be better, thanks to him. Next morning, the bell rings across the heights. Kids come flying into the room. Sean is like, Miss McGee, Miss McGee, can you call my house again tonight? And I said, oh, Sean, yesterday was a pretty special day. But why? What happened? He said, it was the middle of the night. I was sound asleep. My dad came in and woke me up. Got me up and took me to the kitchen table and we had chocolate ice cream. <laughs>
the epileptic seizure and complications, and Sean was home with him. That's not the way I wanted the story to go, but I have seen Sean many times since, and every single time he tells me the best memory of my father, my experience with him, was because of your sunshine call. And I tell that story not to
hundreds of them every year. And those are what I use for my kids to take home to share with their parents and to read with the parents. And I found that they went home and came out of the backpack and came back much more consistently than some of my guided reading books or um, other books that I wanted my students to be reading because the ownership was there and the students. And I got phone calls and sunshine calls back from parents to me uh, about the humor and the fun and seeing some of the writing and reflections. Of course, you have to have permission to do that, which I, I did. Um, and then at the end of every year, I made copies of the books that I wanted to keep and have with me for my presentation. Lastly, and I want to be really quick about this, uh, Nearing the end of my career now, Mike and I were talking, he said, when can you retire? I said, not ready yet, but I could retire next year. I'm not going to retire until I stop bouncing out of bed in the mornings. Um, but one of the things that I learned in the last five years, and uh, hands up if you're in the sandwich generation by any chance right now, is that you're taking care of your young ones and you're taking care of your parents. It's difficult, and it caused me to reflect on, on life, and I'm just going to end with this, because you are ambitious, brilliant leaders, and the work that you're doing is absolutely incredible here, and taking this profession to a higher level. Always, you know, just driving home this afternoon, think about your priorities. And when my parents were both passing away, my mom was on dialysis for five years, I, I constantly, they, they were number one. And after they passed away, my husband, who's a high school teacher, in had a conversation with me. He said, you know, when both my mom and dad passed away, I thought I was going to have lost my wife. Because for the past five years, I've watched this ladder of love that you have. And he said, your parents have been for five years on the top of that ladder of love. And next, it's Abby and Mallory, our two daughters. He goes, and I get that. Like, I understand that. He goes, and then the third rung is teaching. And now it's your new job at Expo and presenting it. He goes, I get that too. That's part of why I fell in love with you is that he goes, but honestly, for five years, I feel like I've just been hanging on that last <laughs> rung, the ladder of love. And I'm like, honey, you forgot about practice. You are a gorgeous funny dog. <laughs> There's one rung above you. And he's like, oh, great, thanks. Anyway, I did this little keynote somewhere, and I had a teacher come up to me afterwards and say to me, why don't you go home and tell your husband that maybe he's holding the ladder of love? The bottom line, um, and I did tell him that, and I kind of wish I hadn't, because every once in a while when I'm leaving now, he's a bit stingy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making dinner, so fine. <laughs> and I was like, I wish I hadn't done. But what I'd like to leave you with is think about your ladder of love, your priorities. Um, I have no regrets because of the order of that ladder of love, and it changes. Um, thank you for taking this profession to a higher level. And Celebrate that, and uh, thank you for giving me another reason this morning to bounce out of bed. Wow.